Well, can there be an alternative, friendly to the markets, uh, model of democratic Islam, or is there, I should say? Turkey and Indonesia, as well as other cases, are interesting cases for us. What is the connection between the sense of isolation uh, that emerge from such countries uh, to their global aspiration. That's another aspect that might come up in this panel as we have two lectures on internal models of politics and one lecture on a very connected, in my opinion, but we'll see what you think, um, subject on foreign policy. In what way the internal model of relationship between uh, religion um, and, and state, in what way it's going to affect um, the regional perceptions, foreign affairs, and perhaps world order. These are all questions that might emerge, I hope they will emerge uh, in the following discussion. And because I have high hopes for interesting discussion, uh, an interactive one, uh, I will restrict the um, uh, with your permission, I will restrict you to 20 to 22 minutes uh, each. Um, and then we, we will have another, I think, 15 minutes um, and perhaps a little bit more uh, time for discussion. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Hakan Yavuz. Uh, he's a professor of political science from the University of Utah. Professor Yavuz received his early education in Ankara, Turkey, graduated from, uh, with a BA from um, Ankara, received his MA from the University of Wisconsin, and spent uh, also uh, a semester here in Israel at the Hebrew University in 1990. Professor Yavuz is well known uh, to anyone who deals with uh, Islam um, and the connection between uh, Islam and uh, I would say different models of modernities. Uh, and uh, definitely uh, is well known to anyone who deals with Turkey. He's the author of a uh, few books and many articles. Among them I will mention uh, his book on Islamic political identity in Turkey that came up at Oxford University Press in 2003. Um, he's a co-editor editor with John Esposito of uh, Turkish Islam and the Secular State, the Gulen Movement. Um, and his recent book on secularism and Muslim democracy in Turkey was published uh, only a few months ago, I think in March 2009, uh, by Cambridge University Press. And today, he will speak about the zones of political Islam, the case of Turkey. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation as well. It's always nice to come back to Hebrew University because I spent here for seven months and Moshe Maus actually was the first professor who introduced me to the study of Middle East. Um, what I would like to do today is uh, my talk consists of three parts. In the first part, I want to make some distinction between Islam, Islamism, and Islamiyet. In the second part, I want to disaggregate Islamic world very much. I s defer from Samuel Huntington and Bernard Lewis, their description of Islam and Islamic world as homogeneous unified one. I would argue that there are different zones of Islam and in the final uh, part, in the third section, I will try to lay out a Turkish Islam, main features of Turkish Islam. Um, Samuel Huntington, his main work on the clash of civilization, he very much presented a unified Islamic world, one civilization. Um, I would argue that um, uh, what we have, not one unified Islamic world, but rather um, a different 
contextualization or vernacularization of Islam. In other words, to understand Islam, Islamism, and Islamiyet, it is very important to see the interaction between text, context, and actor, the believers. In other words, that by text I mean Quran and Hadith, by context the different socio-political conditions and structures, and then you have believer, the agent, very much in interaction or confined by the text and context at the same time. And I, on the basis of this interaction between text, context, and the believer, the actor, the agency, I uh, developed seven different zones of Islam. These zones are defined in terms of conversion patterns, colonial legacy, type of nationalism, and type of political economy. These are the major factors which help under, us to understand what type of Islam is likely to become dominant in each different zones. Each zone's understanding of political role of Islam varies in terms of, again, on the basis of their socio-political conditions. By seven different zones, I mean uh, the first Arab zone. I'm not going to examine all these different zones because I have only 20 minutes. And the first is the Arab zone. And Arab zone, uh, the second Persian zone, th third one is Turkish zone. Port one, South Asian zone, which includes Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan. The fifth zone, I call it Malay zone or Southeast Asian zone, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Muslim minorities in Philippines and Thailand. Sixth zone is the African zone. By African zone, I mean black Africa. The seventh is the diaspora zone. And I will try to examine the characteristics of Islam in each zone on the basis of different socio-political factors uh, by only focusing on Arab and a little bit the Persian zone, but most of the time I want to spend on the Turkish zone. Uh, let me give you my conclusion. My conclusion is that the past of Islam belongs to Middle East. The future of Islam belongs to periphery. By periphery, I mean Southeast Asian zone. I mean Malaysia, Indonesia, Tataristan, Turkey, and Bosnia. And the reason, because of bourgeoisie, because of type of economy, the, 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 the type of political economy in these zones are very much outside the control of the state. And the agent of contemporary Islam is not going to be the ulama. It is not going to be Sayyid Qutb or Tariq Ramadan. I would argue the agents of Islam in the future are going to be the merchant class, the bourgeoisie, that the transnational economic networks are going to shape the type of Islam we are going to see. Now let me ta uh, start with Arab zone. The Arab zone represents the origin and the past of Islam because Islam emerged or evolved in the, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. The, the Arabic language and identity very much dominates Islam. Islam emerged as Arab religion or Arab faith system. Eventually it became universal. Both the birthplace and language very much uh, shapes the Arab zone. And then the third factor is the tribalism. Even though Prophet Muhammad tried to create a new sense of identity by overcoming tribalism, sense of ummah, but I would say Prophet, uh, the, the project very much failed. The tribalism, the Asabiya still very dominant. Another factor which shapes Arab understanding of Islam, which in terms of the context is the colonialism. I think the Bernard Lewis was right that after 1258,
the Arabs, they lost the leadership of Ummah, very much the Ottomans, Safavid, and Mughal became the dominant, three dominant empire, and um, the, the elite of these empires came from Central Asian uh, area. So the colonialism very much, or <clears throat> according to some, continued until Arab nation state formation. And so the, <clears throat> in addition to colonialism, the type of national liberation movement in the Arab world very much also shapes their understanding of Islam. The, another factor is Arab-Israeli conflict, especially the 1967 war, very comparable to 1258 what happened uh, in the, uh, the collapse of time or in the Arab political consciousness, 1967, and this uh, sense of siege mentality, I would say, the Arab-Israeli conflict somewhat enhanced in the Arab world. And the most important factor to understand why Islam is different in the Arab zone, I would say the oil, rentier economy, that the economic activity very much under the control of the state. So in order to enhance and consolidate civil society, you do not have economic resources outside the control of the state. And um, you do not have a powerful bourgeoisie in the Arab countries. I think that this is very much shapes the Arab zone uh, in terms of the colonial tribalism, colonialism, Arab-Israeli conflict, and oil. These are the major factors. I don't have time to examine how they shape the understanding of Islam. The second uh, zone is the Persian zone. I have to go very quick. Here in the Persian zone, you had the high civilization before Islamization process. So the Persians, they managed to create or their own vernacular Islam. It is, I would say, the Safavid Islam very much became dominant in the 16th century by the Safavid uh, rule and then the Qajar rule. The Persian zone had very little colonial, exper uh, colonial legacy. Therefore, there was, in the 19th century, British and Russian intervention, but overall, Persia uh, remained somewhat independent. So uh, until 1953, CIA-led coup d'etat, which uh, turned Iranian public against the United States, but the oil, the rentier e economy again, is very dominant how Islam is understood in this uh, area. Now let's come to Turkish zone. Um, I think the Turkish zone is somewhat different uh, there are five major characteristics in the Turkish zone of Islam. One is Sufism. The Sufism is the dominant feature of Turkish Islam. Second, Islam of Turkey is a frontier Islam. This frontier Islam, which brings orthodox and heterodox clash in the Turkish Islam and it creates a dynamism. And also because it is on the frontier, it had the sense of insecurity and tried to overcome it in terms of align itself with the state. The ulama very much became part of the Ottoman um, entity. So the first one is Sufism, second one is frontier Islam, third one there is no colonial legacy in Turkey. This is why today you have a pro-Islamic government in Turkey, but their main goal is to join the European Union. The difference between the pro-Islamic party and Kemalist, the Kemalists, they wanted to be sugar in the coffee. They wanted to melt inside the coffee to overcome the identity problem. Whereas the current government, pro-Islamic government, they want to be cream in the coffee. They, want, they don't want to lose their own identity, but they want to join the European Union because you don't have the siege mentality in Turkey that the Turks uh, had much better relationship with Europe because no defeat of 1967 or other colonial uh, 
uh, intervention in Turkish politics, the last war the Turks engaged was in 1974 over the Cyprus issue. Turkey won and somewhat it consolidated the self-confidence or the Kemalist um, system in, in Turkey. And the, the port characteristics of Turkish Islam is that Islam becomes a sine qua non for Turkish identity. In other words, Islam provided a melting pot for Albanians, Bosnians, Pomak, Turbesh, Kazakh, Kyrgyz to melt and become Turk. In other words, in order to be a Turk, being becoming a Muslim or being Muslim was one of the first necessary condition. So the Islam, the state, the Kemalist state created this uh, uh, directorate of the religious affairs. The Kemalist state wasn't anti-religious, but it, it, it tried to create its own enlightened Islam and create its own vision of Islam. The finally, I think the most important factor, then I want to move uh, the last part, there is no oil in Turkey. Thanks God, there is no oil in Turkey. This is a text-based economy. In that sense, uh, Magna Carta, the connection between taxation and representation makes sense in Turkey. And most of the economic activity in Turkey is not under the control of the state. This is, Turkish economy today is the 17th largest economy in the world. And, um, uh, and this is also last uh, seven years, most of the foreign investment is coming from Gulf and Arab countries. So there is also this dimension of um, the, uh, the, the investment. Now let me um, go a little bit detail and um, examine why the new bourgeoisie is going to be the agent of contemporary Islam. This is why the Middle East represents the past of Islam, especially the Arab zone, whereas Malaysia, Tataristan, Bosnia, and Turkey, where the future of Islam is going to be shaped. Uh, what you have in the case of Turkey is that the Turks they argue that, that the Kemalist project was somewhat misunderstood modernity. The Kemalist conception of modernity was modernization without Islam. The new conservative pro-Islamic AKP's understanding of modernity is modernization with Islam. So not modernization without Islam, but modernity modernization, democracy, including secularism with Islam, not without Islam. I think this is the correct way. This is, is the most likely path to succeed in terms of creating a modern, secular Turkish society with Islam. In other words, Turkey or most of the Muslim countries did not go to Protestant Reformation, no industrial revolution, you don't have Hegel or Kant. So political language, the notion of legitimacy, loyalty, and identity very much steeped in Islamic concept and Islamic history. And even moral discourse, you don't have the secular ethic. Even the moral discourse in Turkey or in many other Muslim countries deeply rooted in Islamic terminology. So if you are going to modernize society, if you are going to take society from the point A to point D, you have to do it with the language of the society which sees it as legitimate. This is why I would argue what Turkey provides a model, not a Kemalist model of modernization without Islam, but Turkey provides a model modernization with Islam, just like in the case of Malaysia or 
what is going on, the Jadid movement in Central Asia in the 19th century, and now you see the Jadidism is becoming uh, somewhat visible in Tataristan or in other parts of the region. Uh, the, the role and meaning of Islam or Islamism certainly vary according to context. Here in the Turkish context again, that the neoliberal economic policies of Turgut Özal in 1980s helped to create a new Anatolian Muslim bourgeoisie. And what we are seeing is that this new Anatolian uh, bourgeoisie is very much the AKP, the Justice and Development Party, is the outcome of this long process rather than the cause of Islamization of Turkish society. Turkey, Bernard Lewis was right to conclude that there is an Islamization in Turkey, but that Islamization doesn't necessarily mean Islamic Republic of Turkey. In other words, options are not between Mecca and Meccanization, what the Daniel Lerner argued, but rather what we are seeing, the Turks are trying to create Mecca within Meccanization that these are not contradictory, but rather what we are seeing is that the Islam of Turkey today, it does not close door Turkey's interaction with Europe or the United States, but rather it opens new uh, space, new cognitive space. And especially with the, what is going on in terms of the globalization, that the nation states are becoming less uh, effective. There is erosion of sovereignty and power of the nation state. The networks are becoming more important, network societies. And in the larger Muslim context, what we are seeing is the revival of transnational Muslim public sphere and transnational networks of Naqshbandiya, Kadiriya, especially the Nur movement in Turkey, which is centered very much in Turkey. The Islamic, uh, when the Islamic movement in Turkey has a potential to moderate itself, I think this moderation of Islamic movement, it used to be very anti-Western, it used to be very anti-Semitic to some degree, but today I would say the Islamic movement in Turkey became much more moderate, much more open to democracy and civil society as a result of three structural transformation. One, I mentioned uh, earlier the neoliberal economic policies of Turku Tozal. Second is the digital technology, especially the expansion of the public sphere. Turkey is now, most of the private re radio stations, TV stations, universities are outside the control of the state and most of them are subsidized by this new Anatolian Muslim bourgeoisie. So there is a, a financial means to consolidate or maintain civic networks outside the control of the state. And the third one is the political participation and new human rights discourse as a result of Copenhagen criteria or, or the requirement to, uh, to become a member of the European Union. Turkey had to go through some legal changes. What emerged in Turkey, what I call it Calvinist Islam, that the jihad, according to Turks, in the market, New Ghazis, or those who know Ottoman history, New Ghazis are not the generals or pashas. New Ghazis are very much the merchants. I think this is the, the vision of the contemporary government in Turkey, and this is the vision very much dominated by Musiat. Musiat is the new Anatolian uh, businessman association. Where, uh, it, it was founded in 1995. Uh, in opposition to Tusiat, the Kemalist Secular Businessmen Association. Um, what we are seeing in Turkey that the architect of new Turkey and architect of new Islam, the Islam of 2009 is not the same Islam of 
1950s or 1920s. This is, I would say, a, a different type of Islam in terms of uh, stress and work ethic, in terms of putting emphasis on earning money and putting emphasis on charity, that those who make more money, God loves them more. This is the new common sayings by one of the Nakshi leaders. Uh, today, I would argue that uh, the, in Turkey, uh, I know there are some concerns in the Israeli public among the intellectuals as well, but I would argue that uh, the main orientation of Turkey is, I would say, correct, and Turkey provides a model to understand what type of Islam is likely to become dominant in the future. Um, before I conclude, I want to mention uh, just two uh, factors. The, uh, what I see overall in the, in the case of the Middle East, which is very much also important for Turkey as well, that uh, as a result of globalization, we see the erosion of nation state, we see the impact of digital technology, especially the TV and radio stations. The third one, the economic, the market provides a more, um, market provides a model to rethink politics, society, even religion. And as a result of these uh, uh, developments of erosion of the nation state, the new public sphere and new sense of market, we are seeing a number of implications. I, I want to end by emphasizing these implications since I don't have time. The first, what we are seeing in the overall in the mi Middle East, especially Turkic and the Arab zone, uh, the the emphasis on the transnational Islamic networks are becoming more important. NGOs, non-state actors are becoming more dominant. I think these are the what is new developments which would define what is new in the Middle East. One is transnational Islamic networks are becoming more dominant. Second, there is a new form of Muslim consciousness uh, as a result of this transnational public sphere. The third, again, there is a contradiction that the community or communal formations or c communalization of Middle East is becoming also another trend, the, this contradiction there in terms of homogenization and fragmentation going, uh, it's going together. But the, what is uh, also important, the glue, the cement, uh, which is important for the community is the, the nature of cement, the glue, which constitute the definition of being a Turk or definition of being Syrian is, is changing. I think this, the, the structure of solidarity is going through a major change. And what also provides a confidence for these communities to develop their own sense of being different and also create um, cross uh, alliances or what so uh, someone called bridging identities are becoming more important in the Middle East is also a new sense in the Middle East, especially in Turkey, that the United States is not credible after what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan that there is a sense, especially on the part of Turkish elite, that you can ignore United States. Uh, not totally, but the US is not what it used to be in the Middle East, I would say, after what happened in Iraq. And I think this is much the sense is more dominant among the merchants or new evolving bourgeoisie in the region, and I will end here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think your last sentence is uh, probably going to connect us with the next lecture, 
uh, as uh, if the U.S. is not that credible anymore to uh, uh, the uh, regime or to intellectuals in Turkey, perhaps um, the implication of it uh, are going to be uh, noticeable in the relationship with Israel uh, as the holy triangle of uh, Turkey, Israel, and, and uh, the U.S. Uh, is being questioned now. So this is a good opportunity to represent the uh, to present the next speaker, Professor Amikam Nachmani. Uh, doesn't need to be uh, presented here to uh, this audience, but nevertheless, uh, he's the head of the uh, department of uh, political studies uh, or political science at Bar Ilan University. He specializes in the history and strategic affairs of Turkey, Greece, and Cyprus. Professor Nachmani is the author of several books, including Turkey Facing a New Millennium, that was published in 2003, I think, at the University of Manchester, if I remember it properly, uh, and Europe and its Muslim Minorities uh, in 2009. Professor Nachmani will speak about um, a Turkish-Israeli winter, the war in Gaza. Anat, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. After we heard such a uh, brilliant presentation, mine is covering such a small area of uh, Turkish-Israeli relations. Uh, but I'll try to do my utmost. Anyhow, um, um, I, Anat has just uh, presented the, the, the topic of my presentation uh, concerning the, are we going to face a Turkish-Israeli winter? But I think that I have a subtitle to my presentation, and the subtitle uh, goes like this. Uh, Be aware, Israelis, there is a new old regional power in the area. How come you were caught unprepared? And in a moment, you'll, 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 you'll see. Although I talk about Turkey and Israel, I will start with the summation of recent research about Turkey and the EU relations. And the conclusions of this research uh, uh, goes like this. A. Not long ago, Turkey-EU relations dictated that we, Turks, we should spend our efforts on Europe. Hence, it will be foolish, if not totally stupid, to become embroiled in the bloody crisis that intermittently erupt in Central Asia and in the Middle East. Not anymore. For various reasons, we decided to return to the Middle East, among other places. And B, the AKP is reluctant to take on tough, potentially unpopular reforms mandated by the EU, making accession, accession seem less and less likely reality. The national, cultural, and ethnic price that Turkey has to pay before accession into the EU is too deep and too painful. Okay. Now, Turkey's bid for EU membership took a major blow in 2008 when the question of its accession into the bloc was effectively put off for another decade, perhaps. Now, statements such as Erdogan's calling the West immoral in 2008 only erode popular support for EU membership. By last year, about one third of the population wanted their country to join the EU, down sharply from more than 80% in 2002, when the AKP took power. The result, Ankara's bid for EU membership now become, becomes more half-hearted. It is opening itself to other alternative, Middle East ones inclusive. Now, I'm not sure that the result and implication of this return of Turkey to the Middle East was really understood and comprehended in Israel, at least. After seven years of the AKP's rhetoric, Turkish public opinion has shifted to embrace the idea of a politically united Muslim world, Turkey in its midst. Some people talk about, really, the resurrection of Mesopotamia, Turkey in the middle of it. And this Mesopotamia should include Iraq, Iran, Syria, the Levant, of course, and Turkey in the midst of it. According to independent polling in Turkey, the number of people identifying themselves as Muslims increased by 10% between 2002 and 2007. Almost half of those surveyed described themselves as Islamists. Now, the result, guided by an, 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 an Islamist worldview, it has become more and more impossible for Turkey to support Western foreign policies, in particular against Muslim actors. The Turkish battalion in Afghanistan will soon leave the country. 
the contacts between the Turkish battalion of engineers in Unifil in Lebanon and Hezbollah caused much, caused much concern in NATO. A NATO, a recent NATO report has recently warned that the organization approaches the day when its officers will not be able to reveal NATO secrets to Turkish officers, lest these secrets will be given to Iran, no less. The teaching of the Darwin theory has practically become impossible in Turkey. The editor of Science and Technology, Belim the Technology, was forced to cancel an article about Charles Darwin and his theory. The article was meant to mark the, the 200th uh, anniversary, of, anniversary of Darwin's birth. In addition, teachers in secondary schools were instructed not to teach Darwin's theory. Now, uh, uh, local authorities in Turkey are now trying to curb the serving of al alcoholic beverages in restaurants. Restaurants on the historic Moda Pier in Kadikoy on the Asian side of Istanbul stopped serving alcohol, leading Moda locals to protest the decision. Now, one possible explanation to these religious manifestations in a country that is by definition secular is the process of Islamization that swept the entire Muslim world and Turkey no exception. So much so, so much so that in certain circles in Turkey, there are proposals to change the unofficial definition that a, citiz that a citizen's identity in Turkey is Turkish Muslim to Muslim Turkish. But another explanation is the spread of democracy in Turkey. The more Turkey becomes democratic Western style, the more Islam is visible, stronger and influential in Turkey and less influential is the role of traditional secular bodies like the military, the legal system, the Supreme Court, the presidency, the YOC, Committee for Higher Education, etc. There is growing feeling that the military in Turkey is being pushed out of politics for good, in particular by the popular power of the AKP. Here one must add the dramatic impact of the presence of millions of Turks who emigrated from the rural areas to Turkish urban, to Turkey's urban centers. They totally changed the Turkish social and political system. These people, mostly religious, mostly conservative in their views, that in the past had limited but influence, limited influence on their country's decision making, now that they are in the main urban centers and with the spread of democracy, they have started to shape their country's policies. Now all this have had its impact on Turkish-Israeli relations. It started in July 2006 in the war in Lebanon. More and more Turkish shops carry clear signs like Israeli tourists are not welcomed here. Turkish public opinion's objection to Israel increased since 2006 and rose dramatically during the Gaza operation and in winter 2009. It included anti-Israel mass demonstration, hostile media, sharp critique by Israel and, Turkey's, and by Turkey Turkey's highest political echelons. Now, what were the reactions in Israel? A large Israeli, uh, uh, you, you will, in a moment you will notice even my, my, my uh, uh, humor in this. I don't know whether it's humor or not, but a large Israeli cafe chain has recently stopped selling Turkish coffee in its shops until Turkey-Israel relations improve. Similarly, a top official at Israel's national airline, El Al, said last October that his employee association and those of several other uh, major Israeli businesses plan to stop subsidizing vacation for their workers uh, uh, to Turkey. Now, indeed, of a population of 7 million, Israel, I mean, about more than half, mi half a million Israelis visited Turkey in 2008. However, 25 million tourists visited Turkey last year, earning the country $22 billion. Expectations for the year 2010 are for 28 million tourists. Now, similar angry Israeli relations, including inter alia, the mentioning of Turkish atrocities committed against the Armenians, the Greeks, the Kurds, along the 20th century. But before boycotting Turkey, before refreshing the Turkish memory pertaining to past non-pleasant events, before predicting that Turkey will beg Israel to be friends, and I'm quoting this, will beg uh, uh, its lobbying in Washington, etc., Israelis should realize that Turkey can get along very well without them. The defiant and stupid reaction, and I quote, if they behave, they, the Turks, if they behave, we should help. If not, 
then while we should not actively walk against, the, walk against them, we should let them know that there is a price for their misbehavior." Unquote. Well, this reaction is baseless and, and I believe also stupid. If you go to Washington now, the feeling in Turkey is that the, the US cannot get along successfully in Iraq, cannot confront Iran, cannot protect democracy in the Middle East without the help of Turkey. This is the same, this is the feeling also in Washington. Most of the Turkish stand is that we are the solution for 80% of the problems of the EU, that is to say of the Western world, hence of America as well. That includes EU energy, economic and security problems, including issues of democracy in the neighboring countries. But see the implications of the above on Israel. From this present confident position, Turkey feels that the assistance proposed to Turkey in Washington by Jewish lobbies to thwart US Congress anti-Turkey motions pertaining to the fate of the Armenians in World War I, well, this is perceived as blackmail. Listen to the following, and I quote, will the Obama administration declare Turkey a committer of genocide this April 24, the anniversary of the so-called genocide? I don't know. At a certain point in Turkey's Middle East policy, those who are pushing the government to turn against Israel might welcome this development in order to say, we told you so. Personally, write the author, I wouldn't care. On the contrary, I would just thank God and be glad that the blackmail which has been imposed on us for so many years has, has ended. There is a lobby which is ready to exaggerate the news from Washington, but I ignore it, because as far as I can, there is no administration crazy enough to turn its back on Turkey." Unquote. The assumption that Turkey and the U.S. have reached a new stage in which Turkey is a much more confident actor, well, this view is supported also by Washington. The quotation below that I'm going to read comes from the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Euro-Asian Affairs, Matthew Brisa. And I quote, Turkey has become a superpower in its region, and the U.S. cannot pressure Turkey. The U.S. cannot do it, i.e. put in pressure on Turkey. If this were the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, it could. But the U.S. putting pressure on Turkey now is out of the question. And probably uh, you all heard the name of Graham Fuller, deputy chairman of the U.S. Uh, uh, CIA, uh, and, and, and he said only recently, there is no longer a loyal, Turkey is no longer a loyal ally of the West and no longer pursues Western foreign policy prescriptions. Turkey can go places where the U.S. cannot, can talk to people the U.S. cannot, and can make deals that the U.S. is unable to do. U.S. foreign policy makers can no longer manipulate Turkish foreign policy directly. Turkey is no longer seen a country that represents U.S. interests in its region through NATO. The AKP appreciates the historic and geopolitical role that the Ottoman Empire played in the region, but views, but views Turkey's current role as extends beyond that of the Ottomans. So we heard also Graham Fuller what he has to say. Now, when President Bush was in office, Turkish public opinion practically hated the US. In the year 2007, only 9% of the Turks held positive views about the US. In the year 2005, it was 9% as well, but in the year 2002, it was 52%. So, uh, uh, um, the recent Turkish-American organization, American normalization, I'm sorry, the recent Turkish-Armenian normalization, Turkish-Armenian normalization agreement has a not so pleasant potential as regards Israel. It means that in the future, Turkey could get along in Washington vis-a-vis -vis the Armenian lobby without Israeli and Jewish assistance. Incidentally, the more active pro-Armenians in the US Congress are mostly representative and Congress members of Jewish origin. Hence, perhaps a more proper title for my presentation might be a warning to Israelis that before taking a tougher position vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, before refreshing the memory of the Turks, etc., we mentioned it, they should realize that Turkey can get along very well without them, in particular in Washington. That is to say, there is a new old regional power in the area which is more confident, less dependent on Washington. Why were we caught unprepared? How come we didn't see it? 
Now, I want to move now to something about, to, to short uh, a presentation concerning Turkey and the Arab Middle East. In the year 2003, refusal, the refusal of Turkey to let US troops part via its territory on their way to attack Iraq got Turkey many credits in the Arab world. The Erdogan parents' confrontation in Davos, you are all familiar with it, in January 2009, brought many compliments to Erdogan in the Arab world. The Lion of Davos is the, is the name given to, to Erdogan in the Arab press. Erdogan is the most trusted leaders in the Middle East. In Egypt and Palestine, 63% say they have a lot of trust in Erdogan, while 30% of the Iraqis say that he is the most trusted leader for them. Perhaps the highest achievement of Turkey in the Arab world is the removal of Arab traditional suspicions vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Arabs viewed the Ottoman Empire as the power that brutally crushed their nationalism. Later on, the Turkish Republic and Ataturk's reforms pulled Turkey so far from Islam that it seems to have no religious legitimacy. Besides, it was perceived as Washington's lacquer, stigmatized by its embrace of American policies that many Muslims found abhorrent. Later on, the Republic of Turkey was perceived as cooperating with the British against the Egyptian and Iraqi nationalism, with the French against the Algerian nationalism, with Israel against its Arab neighbors, with the secular West against Islam, and so on and so forth. Neither of those objections applies to Turkey nowadays. It is governed by pious Muslims, and it has its own foreign policy. Its leaders are warmly welcomed in many places, where in the past they would not even have cared to visit. The AKP and Erdogan's government created a new atmosphere in the Arab world vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Arab actors like the Palestinians, the Syrians, and the Iraqis implicitly view Turkey as the regional leader. Ankara is viewed by some as the coming leader of the Muslim world. Under other circumstances, Egypt, Pakistan, or Iran might have emerged to lead the Muslim world. Their societies, however, are weak, fragmented, and decomposing. Iran is an unwelcome threatening revisionist force. Indonesia is a more promising candidate, but it has no historic tradition of leadership and is far from the center of Muslim crisis. That leaves Turkey, which by happy coincidence is eager to play this role. More so, being a predominantly Sunni Muslim state, Turkey has been welcomed by most Arab countries as an acceptable strategic partner to counter the growing influence of Shiites, Persian, Iran. This was clearly reflected in the success of Turkish soap opera television programs that started to invade the airwaves of Arab satellite television since uh, 2008 and still have a large audience. For many of the viewers, seeing characters who were Muslim with some Western liberal values was posit positively pursued. Perceived, I'm sorry. <clears throat> now, about a word about Turkey-Syria relations. These have almost reached a position of no less than two states, one cabinet. The model of, uh, of uh, Professor Ahmed Daoutoulou, the Turkish foreign minister, is like France and Germany, or the US and Mexico, and the Utulu decreed, we will be more than France and Germany, I mean Turkey and Syria, we will be more than the US and Mexico. The Hurriyet, the, the, the Turkish daily, uh, uh, defined it, that uh, about, defined the Turkish-Syrian relations, Turkey has never cooperated this closely with any other country in its history. Now remember that less than a decade ago, Ankara needed Israel to add to the power politics that Turkey had conducted vis-a-vis -vis the Syrians. Turkey and Iran, only I'll mention one thing, Iran is Turkey's second biggest supplier of natural gas after Russia. Turkey and Iranian trade was 10 billion in the year 2008, 25% more than in 2007. Expectations for 2010, 11, and 12 is to come to something like uh, uh, 15 or 20 billion volume of trade between the two countries. It was 1 billion in the year 2000. Iran's nuclear en energy. Prime Minister Erdogan characterized the Western countries' concern that Iran might be building an, a, a nuclear weapon as gossip and implied the West of hypocrisy. Ankara calls for whoever is anxious because of Iran's nuclear efforts to relinqu relinquish first his own nuclear arsenal before demanding the same from Tehran. 
More so, the hastening of Iran's nuclear efforts in, is attributed by Turkey to the threatening presence of U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, Iran's two immediate neighbors. Now, the, equa the equation, according to Turkey, is simple. No America in the area, no Iranian nuclear project. Ankara will almost certainly oppose any military action against Iran, insisting, as it has done so far, on diplomatic solutions. Now, what is the effect of all this on Turkish-Israeli relations? Apparently, at the end of the Cold War, Turkey and Israel found themselves on the opposite side of the clash of civilizations. Okay, this is a cliche, and I'm not going to argue with this cliche, but I want to mention here something uh, that perhaps uh, a bit uh, support this view. I want to quote from Tzvi Al-Peleg, who was the Israeli ambassador to Ankara in the late 1990s. The ambassador explained that the Turks' sensitivity vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, this, he said, is on par with their sensitivity pertaining to the Armenian issue. Millions in Turkey could not care less concerning events beyond the borders of their country, with one exception, the fate of the Palestinians. No government warned the ambassador could resist the pressures of these millions, uh, 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 unquote. Now, according to Pew public opinion referenda and investigations, year 2007, 76% of the Turks have negative images pertaining to Israelis and Jews. In 2004, it was only 49%. But there is something probably more worrisome. Majority of those who were interviewed by Pew considered the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a religious Jewish-Muslim conflict. It is not a national conflict, neither one over territory, but a religious ideological one. Meaning that even if territorial disputes were settled, there remains the religious conflict. And the latter conflict is usually protracted, intractable, full of negative images, no compromise, usually zero-sum game. Now, before finishing, I just want to mention uh, 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 one thing. Uh, Regional powers do not like to face fait accompli situations. Regional powers do not like to, to, do not love to be surprised. Similarly, the regional powers demand the veto power in their sphere of influence. Leaders of regional powers do not like to be frustrated. I am sure that there has been a considerable personal and emotional level in the recent deterioration of Turkish-Israeli relations. Turkey mediated recently, between Israel and Syria, Iraq and, and Syria, Iran and the US, Georgia and the Russia, China's Muslim Uyghur and the Chinese authorities, Azerbaijan and Armenia, Pakistan and Afghanistan, Lebanese, among Lebanese parties, Bosnia, Herzegovina and Serbia. And it was only naturally that Turkey would mediate between Israel and Hamas. But this time, Egypt brokered a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel. Foreign Secretary Mrs. Livni, we, whom we are going to, to hear this afternoon. She paid a visit to Cairo before the operation uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, informed the Egyptians. I'm finishing. Uh, nothing like this happened between Turkey and, and, and Israel. Although Prime Minister Olmert visited Ankara four days before the Gaza war, he disclosed nothing to Erdogan. Now, Turkey's honor suffered a blow, complained Erdogan. And I quote, I am the grandson of the Turkish Empire that granted shelter to your forefathers who had been expelled from Spain. When you suffer, we sided with you, protested Erdogan about the ungratefulness of the Israelis. The repeated declaration in Israel that in the future Turkey will not be anymore in the position of mediator between Israel and its neighbors naturally added more fuel to the fire. The Nobel Peace Prize just slipped from his fingers, complained Turkish press. It is only because of Israel that Obama, not Erdogan, got the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, Erdogan complained that Perez talked to him in Davos, like he, Erdogan, was the chief of a small tribe. Statements in Israel that Erdogan should behave like the Prime Minister of Turkey, not, not like the Lord Mayor of Istanbul, well, uh, only added insult to injury. I'm finishing one now by, 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 by really reading a quotation, what will be in the future? I won't be surprised if we'll see in the, in the return of the so-called mistress syndrome to Turkish-Israeli relations. It was David Ben-Gurion who coined this title, referring to Turkey-Israel relations in the 1950s. Outwardly, overtly, and externally, 
the countries, the two countries, presented very cool relations between Ankara and Israel. However, covertly, very intensive, intimate relations took place, in particular as close military and intelligence contacts. Are we going to face the same pattern in the future? It might well be so. See the following report pertaining to a joint military exercise that took part some 30 days ago in Turkey. A group of 28, 24 Israeli officers headed by an Israeli colonel trained together with their Turkish colleagues in a Turkish military base not far from Ankara. And I quote from the report and I'm concluding. The preparation towards the joint exercise were done, were done under a thick cover of secrecy without announcing the public. Secrecy was kept lest, lest some people in Turkey would become scared by an early publication of information in relation to the exercise and would cancel the exercise. Senior Israeli military sources expressed satisfaction that the Turkish military continued to be interested in cooperation with the IDF. A week ago, a Turkish ship that belongs to NATO came to Elat, the Israeli port in the Red Sea, and conducted joint maneuvers with the Israeli Navy. Military sources pointed out that the military attaches of Turkey and Israel continue to cooperate. And they conclude, in these dark days of Turkish-Israeli relations, this is something to mention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amikam. Without, uh, in no way I'm going to um, hurt or, uh, the image of Turkey as uh, the center of uh, emerging markets and so on, and definitely uh, Turkey is very important, but there are other economic zones and uh, other uh, zones of uh, importance in the world um, and not far from here that uh, we should look at. Um, so uh, this is one of the reasons uh, that we are going to look at uh, uh, South Asia, uh, Southeast, uh, South and East uh, Asia, and uh, look at uh, areas uh, like India, the subcontinent, and, and others. Uh, even the Gulf states, I would say, uh, may emerge as an interesting model uh, in the future. But for our conference, we are going to invite uh, Dr. Giora Eliraz, uh, who holds a PhD from the Hebrew University. He is a, an associate researcher at the Truman Institute at the Hebrew University. He is affiliated fellow at the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies in Leiden, and an adjunct fellow at the Institute of Policy and Strategy at the Interdisciplinary uh, Center of Herzliya. Giora Eliraz will speak about democracy in Indonesia. In 2004, I was interviewed to the radio, to the Voice of Israel, after the parliamentary election in Indonesia. And then I said that uh, the secular oriented parties won the elections. And then the interviewer uh, asked more precisely, he stated that uh, it seems likely now that uh, the Muslim will rev would revolt against the government. Then I explained to him uh, very politely that we are talking about democratic elections that were free, fair, and transparent, and that about 90% 90, 90 of the voters are Muslims. Uh, since then, I experienced uh, too many uh, similar episodes. And uh, it's really it's very difficult, I think, to see clearly Indonesia uh, through Middle Eastern uh, glasses. Indeed, whereas a manifestation of religious extremism, violence, and terror in Indonesia side by side with the natural disasters have got much attention during the last decade, uh, much less attention has been given to insightful process of building a new democracy in this country, a home to the largest, Mus largest Muslim community on the planet, an impressive uh, process of building a massive, dynamic civil society stands in the background of Indonesian transition to democracy. Many reform-minded Democrats from within the ranks of the huge Muslim mainstream have played a key role in shaping this civil society and making real a vision of democracy, even though the new democracy has opened wide gates for political participation, including for parties that aim to establish Indonesia as Islamic State based on the Sharia, secular-oriented parties won all democratic elections. This new democracy has even succeeded to surmount deep political uncertainty caused by violent sectarian conflicts 
separatist aspirations and threat of terror that marked themselves on, the on its first formative years. Indonesia, that was described in Western media until a few years ago as a terror base and outbet of terrorism, shows in the recent years growing determination and effectiveness in fighting against terror. Fighting terror, the Indonesian government even tries to balance between security needs and democratic values of human rights. The new democracy has also achieved an economic improvement, including lowering, to some extent, high rate of poverty. It even shows some progress in fighting a deep corruption. Impressive also is the ending of the f nearly 30, 30 years of uh, war in Aceh. Consequ consequently, Indonesia enjoys now better image what makes it more attractive to foreign investment. But not everything is bright in this new democracy. Many millions of Indonesians still live in a deep poverty, and Indonesia is still lags behind many Asian countries in global corruption indexes. The vast freedom of expression enjoyed by Indonesian in the democratic era and the removal of severe restrictions put on Islamic political activity during throughout the regime have lifted uh, led on certain religious zeal and in intolerance that were simmering below. The democratic atmosphere even enables radical circles to raise uh, publicly a clear voice against the democracy itself. Some events and development in recent years even challenge to some extent the Indonesian image of tolerance and pluralism. Though as certain drawbacks, the new democratic political system has impressively developed many attributes of consolidated democracy, the third largest in the world. Radical Islamic fundamentalists who reject the democracy seem to represent only a tiny minority of the Muslim in Indonesia who constitute al almost 90% of the population. Even soft fundamentalist ideas were denied by the majority of the Muslim in the ballot boxes and in the sense, a third parliamentary election this year, the Islamic parties gained even less than five years ago, and the incumbent president, Susilo Wayang Yodiono, leader of a secular party, was re-elected in the presidential election. The two leading Muslim organizations, the traditional Nadu Ulama and the Islamic modernist Muhammadiyah, the tens of, with the tens of millions of members, support the state ideology, Panchasila, including the, the idea of separation between state and religion. And, the emerging democracy in Indonesia looms more clearly from beyond the far uh, the horizon as a distinctive model that inspires some hope, whereas Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, not to mention Iran, illustrate very problematical cases of coexistence of Islam in political reform. If you want to know if Islam, democracy, modernity, and women's rights can coexist, go to Indonesia, declared the US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in her first visit to Indonesia. This year, expectation to see the, the uh, to see the democracy in Indonesia as a model for the Islamic world, Middle East in particular, are expressed in the West. But what about the Middle Easterners themselves? Have they really noticed the process of democratization in Indonesia? How they regard it as a model to be inspired by? For answering these questions, I looked into many online v uh, version of Arab Middle Eastern uh, Easterners media mainly in Arabic, asking to examine the interaction between the Middle East and Indonesia through uncommon, almost enigmatic perspective from the Middle East to the Indonesian archipelago. Generally speaking, Indonesian affairs do not get much attention in the Arab Middle East media, and their coverage mostly uh, in the form of news reports is based on leading Western news agencies, with very few expectation in-depth report and articles about Indonesia are very rare in Middle Eastern media and are mostly produced by uh, foreign experts. Nevertheless, a systematic intensive uh, sampling of our, Middle East, of our Middle Eastern media reveals that democracy in Indonesia has not been left unnoticed. News on the election uh, campaign in Indonesia, for example, have reached uh, through local uh, Middle Eastern media everywhere in the region, even to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and to, Saudi, to Syria that is ruled by authoritarian regime. But what is really interesting are not the informa info inf informative reports on the democracy, democracy in Indonesia, but rather thought and ideas of Middle Easterners that have been triggered by this new democracy. In fact, 
Such representations of Indonesian democracy in our media is rather rare and limited to text written by certain advocates of political reform. For them, the democracy in Indonesia is not just another news item, but an inspiring development that breathes hope. It, offers, uh, it offers them an essential evidence that Islam and democracy can go together and that uh, the poor state of democracy in the Middle East is not related to Islam. It also offers them an uh, encouraging evidence that yielding uh, to democracy can surmount all obstacles, even after years of authoritarian regime. It was argued in October uh, 2004, for example, in the state-owned uh, Iraqi newspaper, Al Sabah, that the young uh, democratic experience of Indonesia is not out to reach, to imitate, and to be repeated in Iraq, since Indonesia is not an advanced Western country, deeply rooted in democracy. Therefore, I say, experience similar to that of Indonesia could be repeated in Iraq while taking into consideration objective differences. Some observers from the Middle East are impressed by the political maturity of the Indonesian who are argued to feel independent and free to decide for whom to vote for. The fact that though the country is populated mainly by Muslim, the voters gave the mandate in all democratic election campaign to secular nationalist-oriented parties and candidates rather than to Islamic parties has caught the eyes of some Middle Eastern observer. The Muslim, uh, the Muslim Indonesian uh, voters argue Abdul, uh, uh, Abdullah Madani, an expert of Asian affairs, do not go to the symbols of the Islamic parties to receive a fatwa about the, the, his way of voting, but appeal to his aql, to his reason. Some observer, observers turn attention to the gender aspect, in particular to the election of a woman, Megawati Sukarnaputri, to, president, to, president, to presidency in Indonesia in the formative years of transition to democracy. A writer in Egyptian uh, liberal daily newspaper, Al Masri Lyon, for example, says he has not found yet convincing answer to the question why Egypt, that was ruled by women thousand years ago, has stayed behind in comparison to countries like Liberia, Philippines, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh that had women as head of state. According to him, no one has to throw the blame on religion since Indonesia, a Muslim country larger, larger than Egypt, was ruled by women and advanced forward, whereas the men in Egypt returned miles back. Indeed, Indonesian transition to democracy, the same as some other new democracies also trigger some Middle Eastern observer to, ter to turn critical eye on their, on their country, society and religion. In an article published in uh, Al Waft, uh, a leading Egyptian opposition newspaper, under the title Mada Yaqul al Masriun an Riyah al Demokratia Alati Talif al Alam Hawlana, what Egyptians say about the winds of democracy that blow around us, the writer Sami Buhairi. And that refers also to democracy in Indonesia, give the answer soon in the subtitle of his uh, article. We envy them because they live in a real democracy, not in false uh, like us. In an article published in uh, Dar al-Hayat, it is argued that Islamic societies from Indonesia to Senegal are moving forward by expanding the space of democracy as an entry point to the process of modernization, whereas the Arabs are quite distant from this path, according to, uh, to the writer. It proved that the problem does not lie in, Islam, in Islamic culture, but in the way that Arabs deal with democratic mechanism. Though presented uh, by a few Middle Eastern observers as a model, the, apl the applicability of Indonesian democracy to the Middle Eastern reality is very slightly discussed. Any attempt to dig into this issue requires to look deeply into the Indonesian context for giving an answer to the question why it's precisely Indonesia that has succeeded to move from an authoritarian rule into democracy. But since Indonesia as a polity, society, and culture is almost unknown to the Middle Easterners, this question is discussed in our media almost only by foreign experts. For the same reason, it is very rare to find Middle Easterners who point to the causal, to the causal connection between democracy in Indonesia and the varied attributes of local Indonesian context, such as pluralism, religion tolerance, moderate type of Islam, and inclusive approach of many of uh, its adherents. 
It is too uh, pretentious even to, for experts of Indonesia to offer a solid answer to the question why it's precisely Indonesia that has succeeded to make a moderate uh, transition into democracy. Nevertheless, varied insight might be suggested in a few minutes left. I will try to share you with some of them. Deeply rooted the tradition of cultural pluralism and religious tolerance in Indonesia, including its, in its Islamic context, seems to have high explanatory power. The spirit of these traditions have been materialized in 1945, in 1945 into the year in which the Declaration of Independence was proclaimed in Indonesia into the official political philosophy foundation of Indonesia, the Panchasila, and its constitution. The deep formative debate then between the nationalist and the Islamist, uh, the former, the nationalist, won and Indonesia has been established as a secular-oriented or religious, religiously neutral state other than an Islamic state. Therefore, though the Muslims consti constitute a very great majority, the state ideology treats equally all the recognized religions of the country by keeping in its, as its first principle the belief in one supreme God. During the years of independence, the idea of separation between state and religion has been largely accepted by the Muslim mainstream, led by the two major religious organizations, the Nata Ulama and Muhammadiyah. These two organizations, the backbone of the Muslim mainstream, have played a leading role in building a vivid civil society inspired by democratic ideals. One of the main pillars on which, uh, on which this uh, Muslim uh, mainstream is uh, constructed are distinctive Islamic educational institutions. Many of them serve as agents of progressive ideas of tolerance, pluralism, and modernization. Salient among them is the extensive network of Islamic Institute for Higher Education, Institute Agama Islam Negari, State Islam Institute of Islamic uh, Religion. Uh, students of this Islamic institution for higher education are encouraged to be creative and to uh, s synthesize classical Islamic studies with modern critical approaches. The fact that many of the country's religious teachers, Islamic intellectual, community leaders, and Islamic uh, uh, functionaries are graduates of these uh, institutes uh, is likely to strengthen the, na the national ideals of religious tolerance and pluralism. But while belief in Indonesian democracy as a proper model for Muslim communities in Southeast Asia is expressed in Indonesia, some reservations and skepticism raised about the prospects of making Indonesian Islam and democracy as an inspiring model for the Arab Middle East. It is argued, among other things, that the Arabs tend to underestimate the importance of Indonesian Islam and the Indonesian Muslim to consider Indonesian Islam is not real Islam and as a kind of backwater of Islam and to consider Indonesian Muslim as not Islamic enough. The fact that most Indonesians don't speak uh, Arabic, the language of the Quran, is also argued to cause Muslim Arabs to underestimate Indonesian Muslims. Another difficulty presented is Indonesia's ge geographical location as the periphery of the Muslim world that caused this country uh, to become a uh, arguably less significant on the global Islamic platform. It is said that there are reservations in Indonesia itself. Indonesian leaders, for example, are argued to be hesitant to lecture other countries, uh, to lect other countries and reluctant to seen as an example to other nations in the Middle East in particular. Sayagania, unfortunately, say leading Indonesian scholar, as Yomardi Azra in Baasa, Indonesia, Indonesia ti dakter lalu active men kespor Islam Indonesia ke negara negara line. Indonesia is not too active in exporting of Indonesian Islam to other countries. On the other hand, it is be said, it, it is uh, to be said that Indonesia under Susilo Oyang Yudhoyono appears to seek a higher profile of involvement in international politics including a greater involvement in the Middle East. Between the reasons that uh, explanation that uh, have been given by Indonesia for such ambition is a self-belief in idealistic mission of promoting uh, international peace, security, tolerance in the global arena in general, and in, of being involved in uh, mediating and peacemaking in the Middle East in particular. For proving its uh, credential, Indonesia emphasized its being both the most Muslim-populated country and a democracy. 
One can assume that the model of democracy presented by Indonesia might be perceived as a problematic, problematic through a perspective of, pol of political establishment in the Middle East. Actually, it is almost impossible to find in Arab Middle Eastern media expression about <coughs> Indonesian democracy by Arab leaders and by those from the closer circles around them. Nevertheless, after my article, Democracy in Indonesia and the Middle East uh, countries appeared in uh, Jakarta, in the in Jakarta Post in November 2007, telling about some attention that is given in our Middle Eastern media to Indonesian democracy, a prominent Indonesian scholar wrote me that democracy in Indonesia has increasingly attracted attention in growing circles in the Middle East. He noted that over the last few years, he has been invited to, regi to regional capitals to speak on both Islam and democracy in Indonesia. It was uh, argued recently by an expert of Southeast Asia that uh, other Muslim uh, nations are beginning to look at what Indonesia has done right. Saudi Arabia, Yemen, re in Egypt, and other nations have adopted de-radicalization uh, de uh, de programs of their own, as in e Indonesia. Clerics from across the Muslim world have descended on Indonesia to study its religious organization and their role in society. Ideas from the Middle East have traveled for centuries to Indonesia, much less so in the opposite direction, perhaps the projection of the Indonesian democracy into our Middle Eastern discourse, namely from the periphery into the center, is not just a matter of interest for only very limited circle of intellectuals. Open uh, the discussion. We'll collect a few questions and uh, I'll add a few of mine. Professor Moss. Thank you, Professor Zazul. I enjoyed very much your lecture. I want to ask you if you can say something about the implication of this story, especially the relay, which means that to the extent it, it, they were in Turkey, I know that they are not very popular there, and the attitude of Islam and also to our issue. come and then the two of you. Yeah, sorry, Oven. Okay, uh, to two of our speakers, to Professor Ayahud, um, I'm a little, I, I'm not very clear why the term frontier Islam can still be used in Turkey today. That may have been very appropriate six or 700 years ago, or even 400 years ago, but I wonder if it's really a realistic uh, description of, uh, of what makes Islam ticking in, in, in Turkey today. And I also think that the term uh, the new Ghazi for merchants is a very nice metaphor, but again, I wonder if that's really an exact, uh, exact description, a, a scientific description of, of, of merchants in, in, in Turkey today. To Professor uh, Nahmani, my good friend, Mikhail Nahmani, um, I, I promise you I will continue to drink Turkish coffee, and uh, I still visit Turkey, and I probably still will visit Turkey. However, I wonder what a reason wasn't at all clear from your talk, if I understood correctly, what a recent Israeli response should be beyond groveling um, to Turkey and, and, and saying me, mea culpa. Um, and, and I just wonder if you think that uh, Israel should respond either us as Israelis or us as Israeli scholars or Israel as a state, how we should respond. Okay. Mehdi, Meir, and you, and very short, please. <laughs> Okay, I, I have two questions for uh, Professor Hassan <laughs> uh, The first one is that like, when you, you were explaining the zones of uh, Islam, you mentioned that uh, one of the things that was uh, particular for the Turkish, Turkish case was the fact that there is no instrumentality. And actually, and you connected this to the good relations between the EU and Egypt and Turkey and, and etc. And I want to say that like, one of the first things that we learned about Turkish foreign policy is Saved mentality and uh, how this causes a siege mentality in Turkey. And 
from what I observe, it doesn't matter if you're Islamic or Republican or Catholic in Turkey, you're, you're nationalist in any case, and this uh, Serb uh, siege mentality is always uh, ruled. And the second, the second question that I have, like when, w when you were analyzing the Turkish case, you said that because of the new EU criterion and the Anatolian Tigers, the media outlets uh, are not uh, owned by the state or they're not controlled by the state. And I think if we look at it economically, this is correct. But what do you say about the Aydın Doğan controversy and how the state actually um, uh, controls, I mean, I should say probably the government controls the media outlets by pressure and by taxes and things like that. Thank you. Okay. May you? Uh, my question or comment to Professor Yavuz, uh, following uh, Mehdi's uh, comment, you argued and rightfully that there is no uh, colonial legacy in Turkish uh, discourse. However, what about the uh, Ottoman legacy, which uh, Turkish Islamists are trying to revive in order to broaden their base of legitimacy and uh, also to justify uh, regional involvement? Okay, there is one over there. Turn to Islam to help the minorities, but this uh, matter did not succeed uh, concerning the Kurds. Maybe you mentioned some detail to which extent really there is any success to uh, to lessen the revolt of the Kurds. The second uh, question: What is your opinion about the Turkish uh, policy? which defends strongly the international arena, the Iranian, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, nuclear weapon policy, uh, the, that in my opinion, in the future, Iran will be a dangerous uh, country to Turkey, and the hist history will return as it was in the period when there was a war between the Safavid Empire and the Ottoman Empire. Thank you. Okay. I will ask another question. Uh, but isn't it clear that uh, after Turkey is trying to go into to the EU, uh, the first step and the most uh, reasonable step to do in the minute uh, they're waiting for a few years is to go to the ancient uh, friends of them like. Syria, uh, Syria, Turkey, and Syria, Iran, and everything, and not blaming them for uh, not uh, waiting for uh, for ages for the EU and the US uh, getting them into the family of uh, state. Okay. Can you just summarize yeah. it very shortly? Okay. Uh, what is the question? The question is uh, why do we blame Turkey? going with Syria and Iran and not uh, uh, understanding them. Uh, okay. They can't wait for a long time. Okay, thank you. And I will add uh, my own question uh, to Professor Yavuz. Um, uh, do we need to redefine the term religion? Because you're suggesting some kind of a new model of what religion is. Can there be religion without law, without the Sharia? Uh, to Professor Nachmani, I have one more question. Um, do you think that uh, Turkey is stretching its interest and uh, economic uh, interference and uh, um, in, in, in too many areas and there is a danger there to its own interests, in your opinion? Thank you. start with the last question. Um, is there a possibility of uh, religion without law? Actually, my uh, latest article uh, is coming out from uh, Princeton University Press, edited by, um, edited by Robert Hapner. The title is Islam Without Sharia, the Case of Turkey. And according to surveys, uh, only seven 
percentile terms, they uh, believe that the Sharia should be the dominant legal system. Most of the Turks, their conception of what, and this is something very unique to Turkey or the Turkish Muslims, if you compare with the Arab Muslims or the other Muslim communities, that the Turks, because of the Ottoman legacy, also the Sharia and law, or Kanun, always in tension, sometimes in cooperation. But um, the Islam in Turkey means, I would say, identity. It provides a set of um, instruments, uh, both in domestic and foreign relations, which facilitates relation within the country, including with the Kurds, uh, the only region identity between Turks and Kurds is Islam. Uh, the, the tension or the conflict doesn't take communal form, I would say. Islam doesn't solve the problem, but Islam plays a positive role in terms of facilitating or providing a, an in between space between Turks and Kurds. I think this is uh, something very important we need to take into account. Uh, you are right that the, uh, the Kurdish issue is something uh, there needs to be dealt with, but uh, Turkey has millions of Albanians, Cherkas, Chechen, Dagestani, uh, Bosnians, uh, you name it, Pomak, Turbash, all these uh, Slavic Muslim communities, but they are somewhat melt into Turkish, the category of Turk, with the help of Islam. So even Mustafa Kemal's uh, nation building project never ever excluded uh, Islam and this Ottoman legacy. Um, about uh, the Gulen movement, the most powerful Islamic movement in Turkey is Gulen movement. It comes out of Nur movement. The founder of Nur movement was Said Nursi, a Kurd, a Shafi'i, but most of the followers are Turks and also the Kurds as well. So you have these cross-cutting leadership or the, the trans-ethnic uh, networks, religious networks, such as the Nur movement. Um, the Gulen movement is, uh, I think, a, a most powerful movement because this is the, the Islam of Turkey is not shaped by Shanti town. Islam of Turkey is not shaped by Maududi or Said Qutub. The Islam of Turkey is shaped by these Sufi networks of the Nurji movement, the Gulen movement, and middle class and uh, upper middle class. So this is something very different than what you find in some other countries. And the Gulen movement is, the, uh, I think, a good uh, example of it, uh, that they are uh, very active in business. They own one of the major financial sector, Asia Finance. They are very active in uh, insurance uh, business. They control, I would say, 10 to 15% of the Turkish media, the Zaman newspaper, the Zaman Yolu TV, Mehtap TV, all these are owned by them. They control, they have the second largest private high school education system and dormitories in the country. The leader of the movement lives in the United States, he's in exile. And there are different stages of the movement. And uh, Gulen gave an interview after the Oslo peace accord between um, Arafat and Rabin. He was very critical. He said, uh, God is going to punish Arafat by making this deal with Jews and, and people who are punished by God. But that was the old Gulen, but today Gulen is talking about the dialogue, interreligious uh, conferences. One might argue that, well, this is Takiya. But sometimes people change their attitude through the Takiya. And, and I don't know to what extent it is Takiya. I think there is some degree of Takiya on some issues. But I think on this issue, there is this cognitive shift 
and the Islamic movement in Turkey was very anti-European Union. According to Erbakan, European Union was a Zionist capitalist plot to destroy Turkey. But today, the people who are trained and educated by Erbakan, they are very much, they want to join the European Union. And one might say the politics are tacky as well because of the military pressure, but I don't think that is that doesn't go that far. Um, so I think the business class here is something very important for the Gulen as well, for the Gulen movement, very much the source of the, uh, the financial sources are coming from this new Anatolian bourgeoisie. And Anatolian bourgeoisie, they want market, they want stability, they want a verse in Quran to justify capitalism. And Gulen somewhat found this verse in Quran to justify their economic activities. I think this is something at the Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, the way in which he is imagined in Turkey, is not a welfare state built in Muhammad or a warrior Muhammad, but a Muhammad merchant Muhammad. This merchant, this business orientation is somewhat constantly stressed. It is the new imagined Muhammad uh, as a result of neoliberal economic policies in the country. So um, now when we come to uh, Gulen's position, I think Gulen is very much agrees with the government over Turkey becoming a regional country, but the Gulen is more pro-Turkish than AKP. But the Gulen puts more emphasis on Central Asia, Turkish world. Whereas AKP, Justice and Development Party, they put more emphasis on Ummah, especially the market, the Syria is a major market. The Turkish Prime Minister is in Damascus as we, uh, uh, yesterday, he went there yesterday. They're going to sign a number of agreement to create a free trade zone between the two countries. So we will see what comes out. Uh, uh, that the type of Islam this merchant class wants, they want that Islam to put emphasis on work ethic. This is something very important than the type of work ethic you see in the Gulf countries where the rentier economy is dominant. There is no work ethic whatsoever. That type of political economy creates a different type of Islam, whereas in Turkey the context very much shapes what type of Islam the Turkish merchant or business groups they imagine. Um, the government Erdogan is very self-confident and we see the Putinization of Erdogan, that the Erdogan is taking Putin as his model lately, unfortunately. There are negative developments in the Country. The glasses have full, have empty. There are authoritarian tendencies in the government. There is also this mixing of anti Semitism and criticism of the policies of the State of Israel. That boundary is also very fuzzy in, in, in recent discourses, what I hear uh, in the case of Turkey. And government is using its power to punish. Uh, opposition media, Doğan media, the, and this is uh, unfortunately what, what Putin did, Erdogan is trying to do the same thing against those media outlets, they are uh, critical of, of uh, the government policies, but they do this with the support of the United States according to them. They say Obama cannot stand against Israel because of Israel lobby, but they say we can stand and say the things that Obama cannot say. And Erdogan was in Washington, I think a month ago or a couple of weeks ago. He gave a talk uh, organized by SETA Foundation, uh, their own think tank in Washington. And he was very critical of the state of Israel. And who defended him was Stephen Waltz and John Mishiner in Foreign Affairs had an article by Stephen Waltz defending Erdogan's policy. So you have this odd coalitions and connections going on. 
So about the colonial, so there are concerns. I think the trend, unfortunately, there is a negative trend, not only in AKP, but also Gulen movement is also becoming um, very authoritarian as well. Um, but I, I see this as a temporary reaction rather than permanent situation. Um, the colonial legacy, the, what I meant by that Turkey was never colonized. In, in other words, there is no, uh, you don't have the siege mentality as one might see in the Arab world because of the, uh, since 1258, uh, the, the Arab world very much ruled. The, the leadership of the Ummah shifted from, I would say, Arabs to Turks, if you take the Safavi, Mughal, and Ottoman Empire. And until the World War I, I think that things start to change. Um, so you don't have that issue. But there is a siege of the, still there is the fear of the Tanzimat and these uh, concessions of the Ottoman Empire, but it is not a permanent, it doesn't play a major role, I would say, in the uh, foreign policy of the government. Um, let, uh, why Turkey defends Iran? Uh, well, Turkey wants to be the, the, uh, the uh, head of Ummah, and the, the Turkish government thinks that if there's going to be a, some degree of unity uh, or the, uh, that they should be under the leadership of the Turkey. So, uh, but I don't know to what extent uh, really Turkey is sincere on that because Abdullah Gül very much gives a different message. Erdogan has a different message. So it is not very clear over there. The relations between Syria and Turkey, um, I think, there are economic reasons, there are a number of reasons. Uh, there's also one thing I think the Israeli public needs to understand, that is the region is changing. And there is a new transnational Muslim public sphere, Al Jazeera, emails, networks, or whatever out there. And there is more emphasis on Palestine than Karabakh issue. There is more emphasis on Jerusalem than Cyprus issue, even in Turkey. I think this is why it is the case, I don't know, but Jerusalem somewhat moved to the same level of Mecca and Medina. There is no hierarchical order ranking anymore. They are all together, bundle of holy sites and holy spaces. Let me give you one example and I will finish here. I told my mother, she lives in Istanbul and she went to Hajj last year, when I came from Salt Lake City, another holy land, and, uh, and in our living room, I see this big picture on the wall, the Al Quds, the, the Jerusalem, and Dome of Rocks, and this is the first time I see in my house, and I told my mother that I'm going to Jerusalem, and she said, you must go to uh, Al-Aqsa, and you must pray for me as well. So what, what I see, I think this is something new. This is something new that there is, again, a new sense of uh, consciousness, Muslim consciousness or Muslim solidarity. And I think this needs to be taken into account. And um, I am not happy with everything what is going on in Turkey, but I think that Turkey overall on the right track in the in the sense that there are ups and downs but the direction of the country is correct I would say okay I, I will answer uh, uh, to professor Amitai very briefly I mean I uh, believe that there are three major uh, uh, Political or international relations systems that, that concerns that concern Israel. It's the relations with the U.S., with Germany and Turkey. Concerning the third system, a very severe crisis erupted about a few months ago. We are all familiar with it, and I'm not sure that people here or even in the foreign ministry know <coughs> know what to do. Uh, people are embarrassed. People are puzzled. I'm not sure that I have the the, the optimal uh, uh, answer, but. Uh, I believe that in my presentation, I said, well, first of all, we shouldn't do, 
which also is how to behave. That is to say, we shouldn't, bo we shouldn't boycott Turkey, because it's really a futile, futile step. We shouldn't uh, stop uh, drinking <laughs> Turkish coffee, as you, you just mentioned, Ruben. It will, it, it, it's, it's, it's stupid. Uh, uh, from time to time, you see reactions that really uh, amount to nothing more than, than uh, uh, reactions of an angry, angry child. But what I want to say is that uh, 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 we see a certain, uh, we see Turkey behaving, by the way, like Iran. That is to say, striving to become uh, really a regional power, or at least a power that nothing will happen here uh, uh, unless Turkey approved, or at least had or has the veto uh, uh, right or the veto power. And if we now face uh, uh, a new Turkey in the Middle East, we have to take into account uh, in order not to, to create uh, uh, further crisis with Turkey. That is to say, I think that it would be impossible in the future to ignore Turkey. This is one thing. Concerning uh, 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 um, uh, uh, whether Turkey, uh, I don't know, if, I don't remember now who, who asked the question. It, Anna. Uh, whether Turkey really spreads beyond its uh, its capacities and limits, uh, you know, we uh, I uh, get a lot of material concerning Turkey from my Greek friends, and uh, and they are very much concerned about Turkey. I mean, they they research Turkey from top to bottom. They write about Turkey. They they lecture about Turkey. And in the University of Athens, you have uh, uh, more than, 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 I believe, two, even two departments that deal with Turkey. A, a, a department that deals with Turkish culture, a department that deals with Turkish policy, Turkish economy, etc., etc. They, uh, 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 first of all, uh, when the crisis erupted between Turkey and Israel, I got, I believe, something like 10 or 20 emails and SMS uh, messages, but we've told you, but we've told you. Okay, so this is one thing. But the other thing is they think that, that uh, uh, we are going to see an influential Turkey from the Adriatic to the, I, uh, uh, perhaps either to, to, to East, East Asia coming to, to, to the Uyghurs in China. And th th these are the ma maximalists. Those who are more optimistic, they see a Turkey that goes from the GM to the Turkic republics in, in, in Central Asia. Whether this is beyond the capacity of Turkey or not, I really cannot ask. Since I understand that everything is clear about Indonesia except the <laughs> curriculum of Pesantra, I think that uh, anyhow, I think I have to say some words about the context. Otherwise, it uh, will sound like a, a thing discussion between uh, two collectors of esoteric butterflies, uh, something like that. So. First of all, the Zantran, I think that uh, the, we call Islamic boarding school. In Indonesia, they also call it uh, the popular level, they also call it Pesantran, Islamic boarding school. And there is another type which is called Madrasa, which is uh, in contrast to the Pesantran, it's an Islamic boarding school uh, based uh, and, and focused mainly on religious studies. Uh, Madrasa, I think, is um, underwent, I think, the more in more clear way, a process of modernization uh, during, uh, during the years. And of course, uh, uh, religious studies, uh, Islam is also taught in, uh, in the national educational system. Of, uh, so, Pizantran, I think, somehow epitomized, I think, the idea of what, what you call the tolerant and moderate image of Islam in Indonesia. That's, that's the basis. They are deeply rooted in the context of Java. And the question was about we, how we are presented as Jews in Israel on this whole system. This is what interests me. It's not an issue. Israel is not an issue in, uh, in Indonesia. So everything about the Jewish and the elephant, it's, it, it's not an issue. It's not, I know I, I face such quite difficult question. Israel is not a subject by itself. Israel is part of the field, or Korea is a part of the court. It's in the package deal of radical ideas that were brought from the Middle East. And of course, if you go to talk with people from Jama Islamia, of course, all the time, so the, 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 the Christians, the, the Crusaders in Israel, and so on and so on. But Israel is, is, Israel itself is not a subject of the curriculum. It's, you see what's going on. It's, it's, it's very difficult from here to understand, to, under, to see clearly in the, the Indonesia. And the same, I think that uh, just general words about solidarity and so on, it, uh, of course, among the most 
the more Middle Eastern oriented groups like the PKC, the political parties, but, the, but as regard the education, it's always not, uh, it's not a subject. So it's not irrelevant, really. I think it's, they are going back to very esoteric issue. That's not uh, so. And uh, more than that, while talking about uh, the Pesantra, many of my friends, they are graduates of Pesantra. Later on, they went to the, they learned in Sitagama Islam Negeri that I mentioned in universities. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Like people, they, they eager, met, many of them, once I mentioned Israel, German Institute, many of them asked me if they possible to come to learn. So there's some progress here. But as regards these people, they went to the Zantra, they are very open. I know that in the recent uh, years, some focus as well as attention Strong attention has been given to certain Pesantra that are affiliated or singlet oriented or radical oriented, something like that. But we are talking about very few Pesantra. <coughs> Even the experts of terror, they are talking about 50 Pesantra. That's all. The number, of, and they are talking about tens of thousands of Pesantra in Indonesia. I, I must admit that the camera like, likes very much these few Pesantra. So that's, I think, the way I think that Pesantra have been exposed, I think, to the average uh, viewers in the West. But it's uh, some uh, people might think all the problem of the coverage of the Indonesia by the media. Sometimes I find myself in a very, I think, it's a funny situation that, uh, that I try to, I think, to... No, uh, I wanted to, to compare that to the Guinean movement, which is both are liberal in Islam, which is quite uh, interesting, liberal education. This is my, my, the point that I was going to make. That the, our image is everybody is you know, so fanatic. And, uh, but no, 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 no. So, so, uh, they all, furthermore, they, during the recent decades, they also they underwent very serious uh, process of modernization. Yeah. And now, now much, most, most uh, thing, the attention is given by the government. You are seeing all these reports and so on. Uh, but uh, since they are the thing, uh, they think some the inspirational, uh, inspirational, I think, that uh, symbols of uh, the progressive and moderate Islam in the region. Thank you very much. Um, the next session will start at uh, 3.30. Thank you very, very much for a very interesting discussion.